So good afternoon, good evening, good morning, to, uh, wherever you may be, and welcome to this very interesting and important event. Uh, my name is Rosalind Smith. I'm the director of the UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health in London. And on behalf of the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of the Biochemistry Focus webinar series. And topics in this series include different research areas in molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support uh, career development. So today is a very momentous day. The first country in the world, the UK, has today announced that it has licensed a vaccine against coronavirus, the pandemic that has been scourging uh, all of the world uh, over the last uh, 10 or so months. And the title of the webinar is The Sociology of the Anti-Vaccine Movement. Uh, and uh, I will introduce you in a minute to our first speaker, Professor uh, James uh, Cherry. And his recent paper on this topic was published in Emerging uh, Topics in Life Sciences. And it's available to read online for free until Friday of this week. Skepticism and misinformation relating to vaccines is a historic problem. The benefits to our society which vaccines uh, present do outweigh any risks, but in, in relatively recent times we've become familiar with the war on science, fake news and so on, uh, and the anti-vaccine movement. And misinformation um, is contributed to uh, through uh, social media, and a recent Gallup poll noted that public support for vaccines today is significantly lower than it was in 2001. And social sciences have presented the problem of the anti-vaccine movement well, but exactly what mechanisms we should use to address it are somewhat less clear. So I just want to say that you're very welcome to answer questions, and we will have 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, so please uh, save them, uh, put them on the webinar as you go through, and we will ask them at the end of both of the talks today. Please type your question in the question box, uh, and that will then um, be read out uh, at the end. Our first invited speaker today is Professor James Cherry, who is Distinguished Research Professor of Pediatrics at the David Geffen School of Medicine at the University of California in LA. Uh, Professor Cherry received his MD degree from the University of Vermont in 1957 and did an MSc uh, degree in epidemiology in London at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 1983. Uh, Professor Cherry has a long and distinguished uh, curriculum vitae. He has held faculty positions at the Universities of Vermont uh, Wisconsin, uh, St. Louis, uh, and UCLA from 1960 to the present day. Um, following his infectious diseases fellowship training, he established one of the first formal pediatric infectious disease fellowship programs in the world uh, at the University of Wisconsin. And then he ran a similar pro program at St. Louis University. And since uh, 1973, he's been at UCLA. And during his 46-year um, tenure at UCLA, numerous trainees have gone on to become leaders in pediatric infectious diseases in the United States uh, and other countries across the world. Um, from a UK perspective, in 1969 to 1970, Professor Cherry was a visiting worker at the Medical Research Council's Common Cold Research Unit and the Clinical Research Centre in Salisbury in England. He's published uh, many distinguished uh, research papers, uh, but I know Professor Cherry as the senior editor of Fagan and Cherry's textbook of pediatric infectious diseases, now in its eighth edition. And today he's going to discuss a longer term approach for physicians and other health care workers to introduce epidemiological education in school and college. So I now want to hand over to Professor Cherry. And uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, 
uh, and I, um, and I appreciate my time at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and it's one of the high points as well as my uh, time in Salisbury. Um, and one thing that isn't on there, I also spent a year in Cambridge, which uh, was also um, uh, uh, quite a good year. I want to start out uh, just saying that uh, I'm not a sociologist, and this uh, paper and talk arose out of a conference that I was invited to attend uh, just over a little over a year ago on at UCLA in, in the non-medical campus, on the upper campus, uh, where I was asked to speak on a, in a sociology thing and really talk about the benefits of immunization. Uh, but anyway, since then I've been interested in this, uh, but again, I'm not a sociologist. So if I can go to my first slide here. Is this all, is that all clear? So first thing is benefits of immunizations. Um, and the CDC, um, if, uh, before the turn of the century, uh, noted that immunizations were one of the 10 most significant public health successes in the 20th century. And I might add, in the first 20 years of the 21st, the same is true. And if we look, this is uh, again from the CDC, um, at uh, cases prevented over a 20 year period, both illnesses, hospitalizations, and death. And if you look uh, uh, in the death column, that it's just, remember, these are thousands. So if we just go down to measles, there have been 57,000, this is in the United States, 50,000 deaths are prevented over that period of time. When you look at diphtheria, it's absolutely incredible. And right down the line, just uh, a tremendous success uh, from vaccinations. And, but I want to go back and sort of go back and where I started and got a bit interested in this, which when I was working with working with pertussis um, and, uh, and pertussis vaccines. And of course, whole cell pertussis vaccines were blamed for all kinds of things. And that, that you, in all of life, there are risks and benefits, but with vaccines, um, you need to separate out the true risk of, um, uh, from just, uh, uh, perceived risks. And my good friend, uh, Ted Mortimer, who is no longer with us, uh, but he was very interested in this as well. And he noted uh, just one, a couple quotes from him, subsequences and consequences are not synonyms. And to put this another way, some people who go outside after a rainstorm and see frogs believe it, believe it rain frogs. Um, so, the and misinformation relating to vaccines isn't new. From the very first vaccine, smallpox vaccine, um, there was misinformation, um, and this was uh, uh, in both in 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 England, but also uh, in other areas of the world. Um, And this is a cartoon from uh, over 200 years ago and showing a woman, woman being vaccinated, but other people who apparently were vaccinated and developed cow parts uh, on their extremities, as you can see there. Another thing that is um, re related to all this is what's called the war on science. And the National Geographic five years ago now um, reviewed this and does, for example, climate change doesn't exist, evolution never happened. And it's amazing how many people, uh, Trump supporters, I would say, uh, believe that and, and the rest of the things there. 
Um, and, uh, and, and one of the things that I got out of this is people believe what they want to believe, regardless of what the facts are. And then there have been several uh, books re written relating to this, the war on science um, and what we can do about it. But I think this and other publications don't do as well. They describe it, but they don't really address how to, uh, what we should do about it. Um, so um, uh, that in 219, there was an upsurge in measles um, in both the developing and developed world. Um, and in the developing world, uh, this is was mainly is mainly due to poverty, displacement, and conflict. Um, and that we our group, uh, my group, the group I'm associated with in the School of Public Health, uh, we study uh, measles in in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, but in the developed world, this is mainly due uh, to misinformation. Um, now, one of the things that I was very well aware of in the 1980s were threats uh, by the anti-DTP anti people, um, because I actually had death threats and had a uh, police protection outside my house for several weeks. And more recently, this goes back to last year, uh, Richard Pond, who is a state senator and who is a leader in seeing that, that uh, uh, children get vaccinated and that we have, uh, he got rid of uh, religious exemptions, um, personal belief exemptions, um, and uh, uh, in California, um, and this is this just happened uh, just uh, last year um, that in the uh, California State House, this woman uh, actually poured blood on him and others um, in um, uh, when they were protesting about uh, this. Uh, uh, this SB uh, 276, the bill that would get rid of uh, uh, various contraindications, uh, everything but true medical contraindications. And this is uh, in New Jersey where something similar happened, uh, just the uh, people uh, uh, against it there. So, um, and looking at this, that, um, this is, this is in Pittsburgh uh, in a pediatric uh, uh, group practice where they, on a Facebook page, um, put a, a, a information about the benefits or the importance of HPV vaccine. Um, and, uh, and that was, it was put up there and very soon it was taken over by the anti-vaccine people. Um, and you can just see some of it there. Uh, the vaccines kill uh, and uh, continue to have more misinformation. Um, and uh, then <clears throat> this is in a practice in, <coughs> in Cincinnati, a pediatric practice there. And they made a, a rather playful TikTok uh, thing talking about the benefits of vaccination. Um, and uh, this was very quickly, within the next day, taken over, uh, overrun by the anti-vaccine uh, people. Um, and, and out of this, um, there were actual threats to this practice. Uh, people. Um, uh, actually threats to the physicians or the, the, uh, the nurse practitioner and phys physicians in the practice. This is switching gears as uh, Moreno Glacier in Argentina. Um, 
And the, the, the thing that I'm trying to emphasize is social media today is a major contributor to vaccine misinformation. Um, and uh, that this is, um, is more than just with vaccine, uh, but this has been very, uh, very clear uh, with coronavirus and the, no, the amount of misinformation. In fact, every day there's misinformation um, relating to coronavirus and what should be open to what, 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 what shouldn't be. Um, and I forgot to say this at the beginning, but I got interested in this when I was asked to speak about the benefits of vaccination at a sociology conference on the non-medical on a non-medical part of the UCLA campus, and one of the speakers was this Kate Starbird um, from the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, and she talked about how that you can be manipulated online, um, and so this is what was quoted in Nature uh, from her misconceptions about disinformation leave us so vulnerable to manipulation online. Um, uh, and when this, uh, Jameson looked at advertising on uh, Facebook uh, and noted that a small uh, set of anti-vaccine advertisers has sort of leveraged this uh, to reach various target audiences. This is uh, in the area between Argentina and Chile, which you could go for just for miles and not see another person. So vaccine support is lower now um, than it was in 200, 2001. And this is from a Gallup poll, uh, January 14th, uh, 220. Um, and fewer in the U.S. continue to see vaccines as important. And just uh, when you look at the breakdown on this, I think it's uh, of interest. When you look at uh, the, whether vaccines are important or not, the difference between uh, 2001 and 2019, it dropped uh, from 94% to 84%. And when you look at the breakdown, but it's so uh, that the, the, the uh, females are smarter than males, basically. Uh, older people are smarter than younger people. People with the highest education um, are have a better understanding of this than those with lesser education. Democrats are smarter than Republicans, and, and older parents who have older children are generally smarter. Um, and then if you look um, at um, this question, do you think vaccines are more dangerous than the disease they're designed to prevent? Uh, again, 10% thought the answer was yes. Uh, and when you look at the breakdown on that, it's somewhat similar to what I just showed you. Uh, older people had a greater faith in vaccines. Um, people with more education had greater faith. Uh, Democrats compared to Republicans or independents, and again, parents of uh, 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 parents with older children. And then, lastly, is the specific question about autism. Um, this is today um, that 10% of Americans believe vaccine caused autism. The breakdown here uh, is somewhat similar to what I showed you. Uh, this is uh, more believed by old, less believed more by younger people than older people, and people with lesser education, uh, and again Republicans. Um, so just uh, going to another person that was at this conference that I originally spoke at, this Jennifer Wright, um, and that. Uh, that people re reject vaccines because they they create this dichotomy, um, which between natural and artificial, and of course 
artificial or vaccines, the natural is, is having the disease. Um, and, uh, and this is her paper relating to that. Um, and Yang and colleagues discussed freedom of speech versus government rel in relating vaccines and misinformation and social media platforms. Um, and this is just uh, political campaigns. The, doctored in, the, the thing I emphasize is that doctored images um, occur and when they're disproved, people uh, just don't care. They don't believe it. And that's certainly true of what we've seen uh, uh, recently in the most recent election. Um, and again, this is the, the, it isn't just autism, other things uh, um, are re uh, all uh, in the armamentarium of the anti-vaccine people. This is a volcano in, uh, in Chile. Uh, so in conclusions, the social, social scientists have presented the problem and anti-vaccine movement quite well. However, mechanisms for addressing it, addressing a problem are far from clear. And here are some papers that, um, this is a global plan, but when you read this paper, it really isn't a good way. It doesn't really say what to do about it. And the same is true of this, this paper here, um, that suggesting they uh, what their call to action, but it really is leaves you rather um, unimpressed. Um, now, van mandatory vaccination works, uh, and countries in Europe uh, that have mandatory vaccinations do better. And this is particularly looking at measles, uh, that countries that don't. And in the United States, states, states with tougher vaccine laws have higher uh, measles vaccine race, vaccination rates than, than, than states that don't have uh, good mandatory vaccination laws. So just to, to finish this up, um, that how I think we should address this. I think the number one thing that I would say is stay away from social media. Um, we, but we need to change the, our, our education. And we need to get science and particularly um, uh, epidemiological science uh, education starting it in grade schools and high school as well as college. And you can go, for, for example, through UCLA and get a Bachelor of Arts degree and not have one science course or one epidemiologic course. And I think that's true of a lot of uh, higher education. Um, and again, we should start support state and, and country vaccination laws. And we should educate uh, the primary care physicians that the parents believe have considerable trust in their physicians. And if they're, the physicians um, you know, believe in vaccines, then the, the, the public will get them. And so that's a, a, a really a, a critical thing. And back uh, when I was studying uh, pertussis, uh, actually uh, in the UK, um, a lot of the, when the immunizations dropped, it was because the primary care physicians uh, were not believing, were believing the misinformation and perpetuating uh, the uh, lack of vaccination. So I'll end there. But again, the major message is we should stay away from social media. So I'll end there. This is uh, in Xi'an, China, where the Terror Carter Warriors are. So I'll end there, and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, James. Uh, I think I'm unmuted um, and can be heard. So that was a very interesting and uh, provocative um, talk. 
just to remind you to um, save your questions. Obviously, we'll ask them at the end of the webinar. I note that uh, questions have started to come through, uh, and I will be presenting them um, to uh, the speakers at the end of the webinar. So that was a great start to this uh, webinar, and I now want to uh, present our second uh, speaker, who is a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Helen Bedford at the Institute of Child Health in London. Uh, and uh, Helen is in the Population Policy and Practice Department. Uh, so Helen has worked at uh, the Institute since 1986, uh, when she came in as a research uh, fellow to work on the Peckham Report, which is a national study of the determinants of childhood vaccine uptake uh, and vaccine acceptance and beliefs and practices uh, amongst the public have been a key focus of Helen's work. In the UK, uptake of childhood vaccines is generally high overall, but there's considerable variation between areas and what Helen's going to do today is to present and discuss factors affecting vaccine uptake, including anti-vaccine sentiment, uh, along with a discussion of interventions that may be helpful to improve uptake of vaccines. And if I can add a personal note, uh, I know Helen very well. She's very quiet, uh, very, very rigorous, uh, but when she's um, involved in public engagement and speaking to the media, she's absolutely um, fearless. And in the UK, we have a very um, uh, interrogative journalist, uh, Jeremy Paxman, that most politicians are terrified of meeting. Helen uh, has no such qualms and she uh, can address his questions with the same fearless rigour that she applies to uh, other scientists. So it's a huge pleasure to have you here today, Helen, and I'm now going to hand over to you for your presentation and to share your screen. Thank you very much, Wills, for that lovely introduction. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here to talk about vaccine confidence. And um, my focus is mainly going to be on the UK, but I'd first like to consider some more global issues. So we've heard about the fantastic um, contribution of vaccination to, to preventing ill health. And it's estimated that about two to three million lives are, are saved every year as a result of vaccination. Yet, despite this success, just last year, uh, the WHO declared vaccine hesitancy to be one of the 10 threats to global health. Um, and this is the reluctance or refusal to vaccinate despite the availability of vaccines. Uh, first of all, I'd like to look at some definitions because it's important to define what we're talking about. And vaccine hesitancy is a fairly new term. And unfortunately, it's used inconsistently. So some people talk about vaccine refusal, other people just talk about um, concern or, or worry or hesitancy about being vaccinated. So there are, what it, can, what it um, embraces is delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccination despite the availability of vaccine services. Key to it is that it's complex and context specific. So it varies across time, place and vaccine. So you may have some vaccines that are rejected in some parts of the world and not in others. And it's influenced by complacency, confidence and convenience. So it's not as simple as vaccinating or not. There's a continuum between people who accept with no questions, so unquestioning acceptance, and then people who decline all vaccines with various states in between of people who have varying levels of concern. Anti-vaccine anti, um, activists are very vocal, very, very vocal indeed, but they're absolute tiny minority of all the population. But one of our problems is that until very recently, this phenomenon of vaccine hesitancy uh, and or vaccine confidence hasn't really been measured. So it is actually difficult to say for sure whether it's increased. 
I just wanted to look at this issue of vaccine confidence, first of all. So this is about trust in the vaccine. So this is about the product. It could also be uh, vaccine developers as well, pharmaceutical industry. Trust in the vaccinator or other health professional and trust in those who make the decisions about vaccine provision. So policymakers, but also governments too, are very important. Now, vaccine confidence has started to be measured using an index developed um, at the, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And they ask four core questions. They ask whether um, people think vaccines are safe, whether they're effective, whether they um, have their children vaccinated and whether they're acceptable because of religious reasons. And this is, these have been applied in various surveys around the world, including a big survey that was run in 2018 in 140 countries. And this was part of the Gallup World Poll uh, Welcome Global Monitor. And what they found was that globally, eight in 10 people somewhat or strongly agreed that vaccines are safe but 7% disagreed with this. And in high income countries, there was less certainty about the safety of vaccines. So in Northern America, in Northern Europe, um, about 72% of people agreed. In Western Europe and Eastern Europe, it was lower than this. Whereas in low income regions, the proportion of people who agreed strongly uh, tended to be much higher at 80% or more, with highs of 95% in South Asia. Now I'm just going to um, look at what we do in the UK. I'm going to turn our attention to the UK. So vaccines are offered to um, young children before they enter school against 14 infections. This includes four types of meningitis, diphtheria, polio, measles, mumps and rubella. Teenagers are offered more vaccines, so they're offered vaccines against an additional four infections. This includes human papillomavirus and four strains of meningococcus. We have no compulsion in this country. An uptake is generally high, but there's wide variation between districts. And I just want to take a look at that now. So in the UK for the infant schedule, so these are children who've had three doses of the infant vaccines by the age of 12 months, uptake is 93%. But there's a huge range between districts with some districts, notably London districts, only achieving just over 70%. For MMR vaccine, again, by the age of two, 91% of children have had their first dose of MMR. But again, there's a big range. And for HPV, which is given to 12 to 13 year olds, 83.9% uptake, one of the highest in the world for this vaccine, but again, an incredible range. And of concern, what we saw recently was that over a six year period, vaccine uptake fell across the board. So each year, year there was a small decline in uptake, which amounted to about 3% over five or six years. The media suggested that this was due to the rise of the anti-vaccine movement. So is there any truth in this? Public Health England con conducted um, a survey. They looked at various bits of information and what they concluded, and perhaps the most powerful piece of information, was that they found, although the coverage for completed courses of infant vaccines had decreased, Coverage for the first dose of these vaccines had increased, so it doesn't seem to be that parents are rejecting immunisation out of hand. Another report seen here concluded that other factors were the cause of a decline, including evidence that the 2013 health system reorganisation in England resulted in fragmentation in vaccine programme delivery, and that there are pressures on general practice where most vaccines are delivered. And so these causes are rather more prosaic in a way and don't really get the media headlines that the rise of the anti-vaccine movement might get. And it's also reassuring to see that in the last quarter of 2019, uptake of vaccines given in the first two years had increased compared with the previous quarter. 
So what about people that aren't vaccinated? Well, in this country, we find that most under immunization is due to access and administrative issues. And you can see a list there of families who are at risk of, of low vaccine uptake. These are families with difficulty accessing services. So large families, low lone parents, children in care, those sorts of uh, groups. And some minority ethnic groups, although um, uptake varies widely with some uh, minority ethnic groups having very much higher uptake than others. So this is a fault in the system and this is something we need to correct. We need to be looking at how our services are configured to overcome this. In 2009, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellent produced guidance on how to reduce differences in uptake in the under 19s. And this is evidence based guidance. And what they recommended was using reminders. So just reminding people that vaccines are due. And this is an incredibly effective intervention. It can increase vaccine uptake by up to 10 percent. Using approaches such as opportunistic immunization. So when children are attending for other things, thinking about their vaccine status and, and vaccinating them where they need it, and checking vaccination status at entry to, to things like primary school and to secondary school, and where children need to be vaccinated, ensuring that they're directed appro appropriately. So these are interventions for people with difficulty accessing services. But what about those who actively decline vaccination? So sending reminders to somebody who's decided they're not going to have their child immunized is probably going to be of little value. But what they need is an opportunity to discuss their concerns and questions with a well-informed health professional. But this is very important. How this, uh, how this discussion is done is absolutely key because giving people just loads more information is not the answer. It needs to be tailored to respond to the individual's concerns. The nature of the communication is absolutely critical because what we're trying to do is develop trust because that is absolutely key. So how do we do this? Surely all we need to do is just say to parents, these diseases are terrible, they can kill your children, get your children immunized. And this is an example that's often used. Roald Dahl's daughter contracted measles in 1962, age seven. So this was before we were using a measles vaccine. And he dedicated the big friendly giant to her and wrote about her measles. She seemed to be making a good recovery. And then one day she started, her brain and her fingers didn't seem to connect. And he asked her how she was feeling. And she said, I feel sleepy. In an hour she was unconscious and in 12 hours she was dead. She had got measles encephalitis and there was nothing anybody could do about it. It was a terrible, terrible outcome. Um, so does this work? Does this powerful information work? You would think it would. It would be logical, wouldn't it? But it's much more complicated than that because research shows that when you make the message too strong like this, it can actually backfire and make people less likely to vaccinate. So it's not necessarily about giving the people a lot of information or scary information. It's how you communicate that's absolutely vital. So in this paper, we highlighted the style of communication that's been shown to be effective and which is designed to increase trust. And the key component that is involved is listening to parents or the public concerns, taking those concerns seriously, responding appropriately, and not just giving a fact-filled lecture, and very importantly, leaving the door open for future discussions. Now, I just wanted to consider one intervention that we could employ to increase vaccine uptake, and that's compulsory vaccination, which has been from time to time suggested in this country and was suggested by the Secretary of State, um, Matt Hancock, last year. And is also be, has, has been discussed in relation to COVID, COVID vaccine. So first of all, I want to consider several points. Is it needed? Is it effective? Does it have any untoward effects? And are there other solutions for improving vaccine uptake? And I hope I've demonstrated that there are other solutions already. So first of all, is it needed? Well, 
In the UK, vaccine uptake is generally high. Yes, we do have variation and there has been a small decline in recent years, but we have managed to achieve this by recommendation and by providing information and having well-organised vaccine services. Vaccine, overall vaccine refusal rates are low, about two in a hundred, and the overwhelming majority of parents, over 90%, automatically have all their children's vaccinations done. Here we see countries or the flags of countries where vaccines are either mandated or not mandated. And on the left are countries where vaccines are not mandated. These tend to be Scandinavian countries and they have very high uptake of vaccine. On the right hand column are countries that have either had long established mandates, so for example, the United States, or have recently introduced mandates or increased existing mandates. And one problem in looking at how effective mandates is, is that they're different in different countries. Uh, so in some countries, they might apply to specific vaccines. Um, and, and so it's difficult to gather a really good body of evidence about the effect of compulsory or, or mandatory vaccination. It may be helpful in increasing uptake the last few percent to reach targets. But the other issue that muddies the water there is when a mandate is intru introduced, is it the mandate that is working or is it the inevitable increase in publicity that goes along with introducing a mandate? The bottom line is you can't pin children down and so you have to have opt-out or clauses or exemptions. And if you don't want your child to be vaccinated, you'll find a way around the system. And one of the problems with the mandatory vaccine is, could this make vaccine parents, he, va, he, vaccine hesitant parents resistant or vaccine resistant parents more resistant? I believe it would be unlikely to make vaccine rejectors accept vaccination. So we need to think about the untoward effects of mandatory vaccination before we think about introducing such a policy. And some of the in untoward effects may be parents are undecided, may become more resistant. For example, in Serbia, where they tightened mandatory um, immunization uh, they f with har harsher penalties, this led to an increase in anti-vaccine views. And if only some vaccines are mandated, others may be considered less necessary. And this has occurred in Italy. So in the USA, where we've heard there's an active, highly organized, well-financed anti-vaccine movement, we see anti-vaccine protests. But are these parents really protesting against vaccination or are they protesting against mandatory vaccination? So earlier this year, um, the WHO announced that um, COVID-19 was now a pandemic and very soon vaccine trials began. Uh, to, as this seems to be the only way to get out of this pandemic. Just a few weeks ago, uh, we saw the fantastic announcements about the results of these trials, um, some of them more gleeful than others. And just today, the UK regulator gave approval to the use of COVID-19 vaccine. So what do people think about COVID vaccine? Well, there have been various studies that have looked at public attitudes about accepting COVID vaccine. And the first thing to say, the first limitation I think that's very important to recognise is that when these studies were done, this was a hypothetical vaccine. We didn't have a vaccine. And when people make decisions about vaccination, they want to know about safety. They want to know if it works. And we couldn't say that because there wasn't a vaccine. So they're hypothetical questions. But what was found was that in a study of 20,000 adults in 27 countries in July, the overwhelming majority said they would accept a vaccine with the highest vaccine uptake in China and the lowest in Russia. And the UK was about 85%. In a study done more recently, and this was just amongst parents and guardians in England, 90% said they were definitely or leaning towards and accepting a vaccine, but they expressed concerns about vaccine safety, vaccine effectiveness, and the apparent speed of vaccine development. In the United States, um, a couple of surveys have been done. They've been repeated. So they were done, a survey was done in May and then repeated in September. 
And what they found in that intervening, in those intervening months was a reduction in the number of people who would accept a vaccine. And amongst Republicans or people that lean towards Republicanism, they were, were less likely to have a vaccine than those that were democratic or lean towards being democratic, as James alluded to earlier. Some of the concerns that have been expressed, of course, have been about safety. Safety is always top of the list in, in of people's concerns about vaccination. But for this particular vaccine, vaccine, there has been concern expressed about the apparent rush to create a COVID vaccine. So I understood it takes two years, two or three years for a safe vaccine to be developed. So I can't imagine how they'll get a safe one ready early. And I'm more likely to trust an early vaccine if the government had more competent leadership. So we have seen protests from people who are anti-mask, anti-vaccine, and just plain anti-COVID. And although they're a small mi minority, they have a very loud voice and a very real presence on social media. And recent research showed that acceptance of COVID vaccine fell by about 6% after viewing misinformation about the vaccine. However, that's rather a one-sided experiment because it was done in the context of there being no equivalent evidence-based information about the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. These are protests in the UK, and it's also of concern that healthcare workers are not immune to these anti-vaccine messages, and that this is a group formed by NHS staff who are anti-vaccine. So in conclusion, vaccine decisions are complex and multi-dimensional, dimensional. But in the UK, we have high vaccine uptake and the majority of parents have their children vaccinated. It's only a minority who hold strong anti-vaccine views. However, the proportion categorised as vaccine hesitant may be increasing and we mustn't um, deny that the anti-vaccine movement is serious and is out there and we must consider it. Even parents with doubts and fears regarding immunisation vaccinate their children. And this is really important because this is how we make the difference. Not everybody is totally anti-vaccine and some people can be encouraged to have their children vaccinated with a proper conversation with a healthcare professional. So I just wanted to turn to the final slide, which is about the recommendations really for the introduction of a COVID vaccine. And actually this is too late now. Um, I should have shown this slide now. Um, but it's very interesting to hear that Germany is delaying the introduction of a COVID vaccine until they've increased public confidence in the vaccine. In the UK, we need to gain a better understanding of concerns, questions and information needs with respect to the COVID vaccine and consider how we're going to manage real or perceived safety concerns. We need to communicate and engage through a variety of platforms, traditional media. I believe we should be communicating through social media as well to ensure that groups who don't have access to traditional media are included. And we need to communicate in a meaningful and relevant way, answering people's listening to their concerns and responding appropriately and addressing mis and different disinformation. And we need to support people who have legitimate concerns. It's quite right to ask questions about vaccine safety and to encourage their questions. Thank you. So thank you very much, Helen. Um, as I knew it would be, that was a fantastic uh, overview of this whole area. So um, once again, we've been getting lots of questions in and uh, I'm now going to start the questions. Uh, so I'm hoping we've got James, yes, there's James back uh, to help us answer these questions. And please keep sending in your questions. So social media has generated a lot of questions and I'm going to group them together. So if you sort of hold on to your seats, I'm going to read out uh, the questions about social media. So Sandra Kirk has said, is it realistic in the modern age to av advise staying away from social media? Shouldn't scientists use it instead to spread the truth? Um, then a, a, a comment from Sam Williams, 
Um, you say stay away from social media, but if we aren't reaching out to open a discussion with anti-vaxxers, how can we hope to change their minds, especially if that's where most of the in misinformation is spreading? Karina Shem says social media has also been very powerful in addressing misinformation and disinformation, and there are many examples of this. Why discard it completely instead of considering it as a useful tool at our disposal for those who know how to wield it well? Jack Leo says, if we are to stay away from social media, how can the anti-vax, anti-science views ever be challenged? Um, Stephen Bornman says, I've engaged with online vaccination debates in an attempt to educate. I have not yet regretted it. Should I resist engaging it in future? Uh, and finally, on the social media uh, question, uh, Anika Roll says, instead of not using social media at all, shouldn't a scientific community rather try to find a strategy to use social media in order to inform and educate people? So James, quite a lot of questions challenging your advice to avoid using social media. So if I could ask you to respond to those comments first, and then I'll move on to Helen. Um, well, I, uh, I think there's other ways. I mean, I think if, if for us, if CDC is very prominent, um, and if we steer people to cdc.gov uh, and to their website where the, the in, true information about vaccines is available, um, and I still, I just worry um, that just from what happened when people use social media and the anti-vaxxers took over, um, and uh, uh, again, people believe what they want to believe regardless of what the truth is. Uh, so I would, my answer is um, is to um, to have CDC um, be prominent, and perhaps they should go on social media, uh, but at least they are coming from an area of, of complete information as a group, not as an individual person. Um, so I still sort of stick to my original thoughts on that. Okay, uh, let's move to Helen now, uh, who was sounding more pro-social media. I, th I think it's important to be on social media because we need to see what information is out there in order to challenge it. And also, um, I am on social media. I mustn't say I do engage occasionally, but not as much as many people do. You have to be quite uh, have quite broad shoulders to engage with some of the most, um, you know, uh, extreme views. But the way I do it is I'm not talking to the anti-vaxxers. I'm talking to the other people who have questions or concerns. So it's it's about addressing the the population, if you like, rather than the small number of people who are putting disinformation out. Um, I think it is very important, but and I think we should be doing more vaccine advocacy. I think you know there has been a slight tendency for us to be a bit complacent about how valuable vaccination is. I think we should be shouting that much more loudly in these sorts of fora. Okay, thank you. So we have another question from uh, Daniel Souza Bittar, uh, who says there is a growing trend of being intolerant to and marginalising anti-vaxxers or anti-science people, which only seems to worsen the problem they create. How can this be corrected? How can people become more open to discuss and educate those who are against science? So again, I'll go first to James and then to Helen. Um. Well, I think I, I, I think that I'm not sure individual people. I mean, I address this every day with the media, um, and uh, for example, with questions about uh, 
um, influenza vaccine. And I think doing that, doing it that way works. Uh, but I think, I think that I would rather have CDC people do the social media aspect rather than me. <clears throat> but I <clears throat> think also that the regular media, the press, um, is, is if you regularly engage with the press, uh, you can get messages across uh, to a large segment of the population. Okay, Helen? Um, I think it, it is important to engage, but I think it can be very challenging. You really do have to be, you know, a particular sort of person to be able to do this effectively. But it's interesting that we're seeing um, since COVID vaccine, a lot more scientists are producing, you know, online videos about vaccine development and talking more openly to the public. And I think that's really important uh, to do that as well as try and engage. But as I say, it can be distressing. It can be really unpleasant when you're get, getting literally, you know, threats to your life. It's quite difficult to, to engage uh, fully. Indeed. Okay, we have, moving uh, slightly away from the social media question, Anne Arnold has talked about the misinformation which is fueled by publication of pseudoscientific ideas in predatory journals that do not practice adequate peer review. I think this is a tricky issue because one of the great things about COVID is that people have put their, their um, publication up there as a preprint before peer review, um, and we can we can see the findings and we can assess ourselves um, what they're whether they're valid or not. Uh, but uh, anyway, she's concerned about um, unscientific or pseudoscientific um, publications. And what are your thoughts um, on combating this new trend of anti-vaccine so-called studies? published in predatory journals, and how can we help the public recognize that this is pseudoscience? So, uh, Helen, do you want to start uh, with that? I think, well, you have to have some scientists that are going to take these things apart and criticize them, you know, in a public place. And there are, there are people that do that. There are commentators who, on social media, who will look at the latest misinformation and they just take it apart. But I think we need to, and obviously this isn't going to have an impact immediately, I think we need to get into school and we need to be better educating young people about evidence um, and, you know, how, what questions to ask and how to, how, to, to, how to look at it, basically. It's an education issue. It's a basic, you know, science, understanding of science issue. Okay. James, do you want to well, just comment on that? that uh... I think for us to see that we're in science and nature and other specific publications um, to keep, you know, put either in editorials or in, you know, significant research uh, to keep doing that. And I think uh, science and nature have done very well in, in, commenting on misinformation and and I think we should work with legitimate publications and as far as predatory journals they all you know right away that if they want to charge you six hundred dollars or a thousand dollars you know it's a predatory journal and there are also yeah. predatory conferences which I d didn't know a few years ago until I ended up speaking at one where they not only, they were charging me to speak, basically. Yeah, yeah, no, I think we're now very familiar with that. Okay, um, I think a couple of related questions for Helen, so I'll read them both out. Um, so first of all, from Fotini Knoil, um, in the case of anti-vaxxers in high-income countries where vaccination programs have been in place for many years, do you think the increase in people opposing vaccines because of the hearsay risks such as autism might have something to do with high prevalences of the disease is being vaccinated against, i.e. measles, 
being uh, out of living memory. Uh, and then related to that, uh, George Corson has said for Helen, do you think more high income countries are in general more reluctant to accept vaccines? So do you think it's the case? And if so, does it relate to people not having experience of the condition? I think it's probably an important factor, but you know, vaccination is a victim of its own success. We don't see these diseases. I was just talking to some young students today and I was just thinking that my children, the, the worst disease they had was chickenpox and it wasn't a very bad disease. Our children don't get sick. We don't see really sick children. Whereas in uh, more low income countries where they don't have such good coverage of vaccination, they still do. But um, these countries are not immune from vaccine rumours, myths and rumours. So there have been very potent anti-vaccine movements, even in northern Nigeria, where the polio eradication um, programme was um, halted for a time because of rumours spreading about the contents of the vaccine. So no country is immune to these. These are global anti-vaccine movements. Thank you. Um James, a question for you from William Carey. Uh, don't many Americans just see CDC as part of big government? <laughs> well, that's what people, um, the people who want to believe that, believe that. But I still think that CDC and, uh, and also aspects of NIH are the strongest groups we have and the most the, the people with the knowledge, and I think it's up to people like me to support them. And 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 I think I think we've done fairly well uh, in that regard. Although I must admit that that the last four years uh, that CDC has been basically squashed, but that's going to change. And and if we have just open dialogue on true, on discussing scientific issues. And I think as uh, uh, Helen brought up is the coronavirus, uh, uh, the vaccines, uh, uh, this is the real area where their clear science has to be put before the public uh, in a meaningful way. Okay, um, so a couple of questions about the COVID vaccine, Helen, uh, for you. Um, so uh, Jenna Jarvis says, uh, how robust is the safety testing for the COVID vaccine? Is this vaccine safe despite its extremely fast development? How do I explain this to people who are asking? Uh, and then another questioner who wants to be anonymous, uh, due to the short time this vaccine has been developed, it could not possibly have been tested in pregnant women from conception to birth, therefore effects on the child have not been seen. Do you think a vaccine that has not been tested in this scenario should be uh, accepted without scepticism? So that's, um, Helen, I don't know if you feel comfortable <laughs> addressing those questions. Well, the vaccine has been developed very quickly, but um, it's, it wasn't developed from scratch. So there were kind of templates that could be taken and adapted for this, for this new virus. And I think what has made it a speedy process is cutting out all the you know, things that slow up uh, research, applying for grants, getting funding, having approvals of, of various funding, all that's been cut. Um, and basically, a lot of money has been taken from other research and just put into getting a quick result. Um, I'm very confident that none of the processes that are normally gone through developing a vaccine in trials have been missed. They will have all be um, conducted. And the regulatory authorities will have looked at the evidence and come to a conclusion that this vaccine is safe. Um, as far as pregnant women goes, um, no, you're right, it won't have been tested in pregnant women, but it's not being recommended for, for pregnant women at the moment. And clearly that's something down the line. We need to know more about the effects of the virus in pregnant uh, women. I mean, if, I if, I, if I could just add to that. So I um, have worked uh, in my career very closely with the MHRA, the UK Regulatory Authority. I think it's a superb medicines regulatory authority. 
Um, I think that they've worked really, really hard to uh, develop a lot of their processes that would normally be sequential to be done in parallel. So the data have all been looked at as they've become available and they've gone through. And I think that they have moved with the speed of light to get the approval through uh, today. I think also with mRNA uh, vaccines, which are the first ones that uh, are being reported on, um, there are inherent uh, ways in which we can move more quickly through uh, to clinical uh, trials. Um, but I think this is a huge triumph and it's going to be the, the vaccine that's been approved today, I think will be the first of a number of others. So I think one can be very reassuring. Now um, we're coming to the um, to to the end of our session, um, but a, a final question I think uh, for Helen and I think also for James about how from Julia Munzer about um, how we can best as scientists uh, engage with vaccine hesitant people. Uh, do you have any plans or advice about how they can best communicate um, or do we really leave this to the primary care physicians who are there at the front line in delivery of vaccines? So Helen and then James. I think there's room for everybody to be contributing but we do need to think about the language we're using. I've heard some scientists talking about their RNA and I think the man in the street won't know, won't even know what RNA is so it's, you have to be very careful about the language. In a recent Ipsos poll of uh, which professionals the UK public trusted most, nurses were top of the pile and doctors next. Scientists were about five or six. So it's doctors and nurses who people trust. So maybe they should be doing this work. Very good uh, conclusion there, Helen. <laughs> uh, James, any final words about uh, public engagement with science? Well, one of the things that I mean, one of the things I found is in talking to individual parents is find out why they don't want this or that, because sometimes it's very easy to to correct individually, and so you have to and the other have to find out what the misinformation is, like it's grown it's grown in human tissue or blah, blah, blah. Um, and that if you find that out, I think some of that can be um, uh, uh, handled very well. And the other thing is talking with parents, you, the, the thing you should always talk about first is benefits. When people start out about risks, and that's the wrong way to approach it, always say, talk about benefits. Um, that how many, uh, how bad measles is, and, and, and point out that measles, you know, kills one in a thousand, has encephalitis in one in a thousand, has SSPE, a delayed neurologic problem, uh, in one in 600 to one in uh, 1400. Um, and uh, post measles immune amnesia leads to increased susceptibility to other infectious diseases point out the important things about benefits of vaccination. Um, again, talk about benefits and not uh, alleged or, or true or alleged reactions. Okay, so thank you very much. I want to thank both our speakers for fantastic talks and also for responding to this very lively debate. Um, I've very grateful to our audience and particularly for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't manage to get through every one, but we got through more than half, which is terrific. Um, and we can follow the conversation online using social media and uh, you've got the links there uh, on the screen. Um, the Biochemical Society um, who are hosting this webinar uh, have a whole series of webinars uh, and you can make suggestions for future topics um, using the links that are shown there. And just um, a, a plug for next week's webinar, which is um, entitled Industry Careers for Molecular Bioscientists, and that'll take place next Thursday, uh, the 10th of December at 1300 hours GMT. And it's uh, organized in association with the ELRIG. Um, 
so there's information about that uh, on the screen. And I just want to finish by saying that, you know, this pandemic has, you know, created great misery, um, hardship and illness and death across the world. But actually, there have been some benefits from the way that we've had to adapt our working uh, lives or every aspect of our lives to make sure that we uh, can prevent uh, others becoming infected. Uh, and one of the benefits has, our, has been our embracing of electronic and virtual technologies and how we can communicate with James in California, Helen in London, and you in many different parts of the world. And I think the Biochemical Society has really embraced this with their webinar series. And you can join their community of researchers and specialists to stay, uh, stay connected and take advantage of key benefits, uh, including discounted registration fees for society courses and meetings and a whole range of other benefits. So take a look at their website because uh, I think this event uh, has certainly showcased some of the key um, uh, benefits of their activities. Uh, so um, thank you very much. Stay safe, stay well, um, and uh, thank you very much for your participation.